and welcome to another evening of Frank Conversation here on Hard Copy, coming to you from our studios in Abuja. I'm Maupe Ogun Yusuf. It's coming, it's coming, and now it's gone. The presidential and national assembly elections have been conducted and winners announced. But the process is certainly not over, as candidates who lost in these elections have vowed to seek redress in court. In two separate speeches yesterday, the presidential candidate of the Labour Party, Mr. P Peter Obi, and the presidential candidate of the People's Democratic Party, al Haji Atiku Abubakar, denounced the conduct of the elections, saying they fell below the minimum acceptable standards. On the other hand, President-elect Senator Bola Tinubu has asked his fellow competitors to now give way to political conciliation while at the same time recognizing their right to go to court. Well, these are not the first presidential elections that we're having. Oftentimes, the process of campaigning tugs at not only our fault lines, but also at the very foundation of the very idea of our nation. These elections were no exception. How do we begin the healing process? Because from the votes that any of the major parties garnered, if any of them was declared, it's obvious that there would still have been many more who didn't vote for them. Is there any room for redemption, given that the governorship elections will be conducted in less than two weeks? On Hard Copy tonight, I speak with Majid Dahiru, who is a columnist and technical team member of the Lux Terra Leadership Foundation. Majid, welcome to Hard Copy. Thank you very much for having me. Um, and, and one has to ask, for a country that is still rather fragile, I mean, we've been at this maybe now continuously for 24 years. But before that time, you know, we've even had a civil war which we have not completely healed from. Uh, why do you think that we need to be even more careful with how we handle the aftermath of our elections? The 2023 presidential election and national assembly elections have thrown up a number of issues in the polity. This is by far the most consequential election of the Fourth Republic. And uh, it threw up a lot of upsets. Uh, it's actually uh, also threw up a lot of um, issues that are quite unprecedented. And the most important thing is, yes, a, a winner has been declared. Uh, and as well, Jeremy Bulatin was a mad as much as the president-elect. However, there are issues in the polity. The other co-contestants are disputing the processes that led to his emergence. The independent National Electoral Commission is taking the heat, as we speak. People are actually questioning its processes and procedures. And there seems to be a general consensus that INEC may not have lived up to the expectations of Nigerians going to these elections. However, from the results declared, one thing is sure, no matter our feelings, no matter the misgivings, the results are a fair reflection of the dynamics on the ground before and during the elections. And as something we've not actually interrogated in all of this, we need to take a close look at the results as declared, and the number of issues will actually be highlighted. And one of which is this, the winner of this election did not win with the overwhelming majority of the total vote cast. As a matter of fact, the candidate of the APC won this election with a minority of the total vote cast. And this is the first time since 1999 that we're experiencing such kind of narrow victory at the presidential level. Not only that, of the 36 states of the Federation, he won in just 12 states. And his closest competitors took 12 states, 11 and FCT, respectively, between Atiku Abubakar and the candidate of the Labour Party, Mr. Peter Obi. And so what is clear is this. Whereas the candidate of the APC won the presidential election, as declared by the independent national electoral body, the APC as a party lost Nigeria in this election. And this is quite fundamental because the last eight years may not have been the best of times for Nigerians. And so it is clear that even the result reflects that 
you know, rejection of the ruling party by the Nigerian people. However, the opposition elements, we are not able to put their house in order and come together and have a formidable front to maximize this advantage of the incumbency disadvantage of the APC. And so, whereas Nigerians rejected the APC, they had three choices to choose from. And so, they splintered their votes behind the candidates of the People's Democratic Party, the Labour Party, and the NNPP. So, if you consider all of these factors, you realize that, yes, the results, despite the misgivings by the major players and stakeholders in this election, this result actually reflects the reality and dynamics on the ground, as even projected by a lot of pundits. And so, I think it's still a fair reflection of uh, what happened on the election day, especially at the presidential level. Well, uh, you've mentioned the role of INEC, the fact that INEC, you know, over-promised and under-delivered. And um, as you said, they are still taking the heat. Um, a lot for us to ponder in terms of, did INEC really understand what was at stake and the responsibility that they carried in those elections? Well, they may have understood what was, what was at stake. However, they underperformed and underdelivered and almost threw up a major crisis at the heart of these elections. However, it is important to also understand that despite their underperformance, particularly with respect to the electronic transmission of results in real time, which was highly anticipated as a measure against rigging and um, all sorts of electoral practices that are associated with collision centers, the resilience of the Nigerian people, the enthusiasm of the Nigerian people, as we witnessed in this election, uh, nullified the adverse effects of the defects arising from the underperformance of INEC in this election. And this is something to actually ponder on as we interrogate the results and question the validity of these results. And that was why, despite the difficulties, despite the landmines that were laid, a lot of upsets that clearly illustrated the deepening democratic culture in Nigeria after 24 years of practice we are clearly manifest. We saw some of the most unpredictable things happening in this election. I mean, parties that nobody gave any chance at all, making gains in places nobody ever thought they could make gains. And as predicted, the election was a very tight race, very tight, the tightest ever. And so, all of this put together, and thanks to the resilience of the Nigerian people who stood at the polling units for hours, sometimes even in, into the early morning, uh, early morning hours of the next day, just to cast their votes. And so somehow they were, they, they, they were able to, you know, make sense of what ordinary would have been nonsense of this election. So I think to some extent, whatever difference that INEC threw up, either knowingly or unknowingly, intentionally or unintentionally, the resilience of the Nigerian people nullified the effect substantially to allow for some level of credible elections whose results, I insist, reflects the dynamics on the ground. You said something about consequential, that these are the most consequential elections since the Fourth Republic. Why do you think so? We are a 24-year-old democracy. And we, are, we can no longer be described as a nascent democracy. Now, the establishment in Nigeria, as represented by the APC and the PDP, have not been able to deliver dividends of democracy to Nigerians as much as they will want, particularly as it concerns improvement in welfare and security, which is the primary responsibility of democratic good governance. However, you saw a lot of anti-establishment forces a coalition, an armada of some sort, of Nigerians that we are determined to obtain the stronghold of establishment politics in Nigeria. And it was highly anticipated ahead of the elections. And what played out on election day was true to prediction. We saw something that we never really, really imagined would happen in Nigeria. 
we saw the emergence of a third force in this election that defied all odds to pull certain numbers that I am sure shocked the establishment politicians across the board. We saw a third force movement, popularly called as popularly called the obedient movement, that supported the Labour Party candidate, Mr. Peter Obi, for his bid to rule Nigeria democratically. And we saw the effort that was put in to the extent that they disrupted votes, they disrupted the strongholds of the two leading establishment politi politics in, uh, political parties in Nigeria. It was such a feat that was one of the gains of this election. In fact, if you ask me, the obedient, and of course the candidate of the Labour Party, Mr. Peter Obi, are actually the MVPs in this election. For me, they have a lot to celebrate. And for me, this is the beginning of a new dawn in Nigeria. So part of the consequence of this election is the emergence of a third force outside of the establishment political parties that came in and garnered as much as 6 million votes and took 11 states plus the FCT. In fact, this third force movement was able to defeat the candidate of the APC in his own home state and was able to defeat the chairman of the ruling APC in his own home state, was able to defeat the running mate of the PDP candidate, Governor Co of Delta, in his own home state, and gave a strong showing, even in the northern part of this country, of the six states of the North Central uh, region in Nigeria, the Labour Party took two states and took the FCT along with it, and narrowly lost Benue State, for example. And so we saw a strong show in him. If you go to the Southeast, there was no political party that was able to make 25% of the votes cast in the entire five states of the Southeast region. So this was a party that took the political space by storm and caused a positive disruption that, if well managed properly, we might be in for a new donor as part of the consequences of the 2023 election. What about young people? Because, I mean, as you said, Mr. Peter Obi had an appeal across the board. It wasn't just to the region where yeah, he's he from. from. And a number of them really feel disenchanted yes. by the process. Um, how do we begin to get young people to understand that this democracy business is long haul? It's a challenge that all of us must address. And that is why the narrative around this election appears to be a bit unrealistic and, in some cases, even inciting. If you look at the electoral map in Nigeria, Mr. Peter B did well where he was expected to do well, even by the polls that projected him ahead of the elections. He did exceedingly well. In fact, he actually surpassed the expectations of even the polls that projected, projected him as leading. But that somebody was leading does not mean he was the winner. Now, there are areas of the country where we all knew he didn't have so much of support, particularly the Northwest and parts of the Northeast. Now, if you look at these areas, it was all know, it was well known all along that it was going to be a battleground between the candidate of the PDP, Atiku Abakar, and the candidate of the APC, with the candidate of the NMPP, Rabbi Musa Kongwa, so causing disruptions here and there. So Peter wasn't expected to do well in some of these areas. And so everybody did well in areas where they have strength. So the youth population, the youth search, are largely domiciled in urban areas and city centers, mostly in central and southern Nigeria. You see, the elections in the north are usually a conservative affair. Or like in the South, where you have urban youths that can take decisions for themselves, and in this case, decided to vote against Asiwaju, for example, in Lagos, for a Peter Obi. In the North, is a conservative system where people wait for instructions from those they consider to be their leaders across party lines. Isn't that changing? It's changing, and that is why Mr. Peter Obi made inroad into the North. So let me take you back again, uh, you know, to what you talked about in the South. Is before now, I mean, even in the elections, part of before the elections, what we saw between the political parties between the, uh, in the PDP was a tussle between North and South um, as to whether or not it should be zoned. And if it, was, if it was zoned, should it be zoned to the Southeast? They threw it open and Alaji Atiku Abu Bakr won. Um, you know, before that time, Mr. Peter Obi had already left. In the APC, they had their own tussle as well, but you had um, Northern governors who said firmly that it was the turn of the South. You even had the uh, presidential candidate of the party, who is now president-elect, you know, saying that it was his turn. I mean, given forth to the Emilokon, uh, you know, syndrome as the case where. 
nonetheless, you could see that there was certainly a region of the country that really felt, you know, like it had been left out. And they, they, they showed their voice. I mean, yes, we had a huge youth following for uh, Mr. Peter Obi, but that could not be dismissed in terms of when you look at the votes. So for that region, I mean, looking at what has also happened I mean, in these elections, how would you say that, you know, the, the, the politics of Nigeria now begins to approach handling such a very sensitive situation? It's a very serious issue. The southeast part of this country has supported every other region for the presidency since 1999, and they have voted along the same pattern. They give block votes to whoever they support in every election cycle. So between 1999 and 2007, for example, they supported the candidates of the PDP, Obasanjo in 1999 and 2003, and Umaru Musa Yaradua in 2007, the same block vote. Even when one of theirs, the late Ikem Bainewi, Chief Oduma Ujuku, contested in 2003 and 2007, he lost in the Southeast. The Southeast voted for a party they've supported since 1999. In 2011, they repeated the same thing for Gulog Jonathan, who was from the South South. In 2019, it was even more interesting. They supported Atiku Abakar from the Northeast with the same, the same resolve, the same seriousness as you've, seen, as you've seen them repeat in this election. So in 2023, they felt that, look, now that power is supposed to be coming to the Southern part of the country, and the fact that they have been very loyal to the PDP, to the, to the extent that they suffered some level of exclusion under the current administration because of the 95, 97 and 5 percent doctrine, they felt it was legitimately their turn. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the PDP failed to zone their presidency to the South, as was supposed to be the case. They failed to consider this very important region of the country that has been their most loyal support base since 1999, and they have paid all their dues to this party. And so the PDP violated its own zoning and decided to sail against the wind of presidency that was blowing south by 2023. And this is why the PDP ship appears to have wrecked. And in this instance, a region that has done the same thing for every other part of this country since 1999 and in 24 years, cannot be faulted for voting for one of their own at a time they felt we have a legitimate right to ask for us to be included as the president of this country. And if you, if you consider the fact that we fought a civil war that we are yet to fully recover from, this was an opportunity for the PDP to have given Nigerians the opportunity now to actually have a Nigerian president of Southeast extraction, who was also acceptable across board. And that was interesting about Mr. Pitobi. Mr. Pitobi enjoyed a lot of support because of his own personal integrity, because of his qualities, leadership qualities that are considered as germane for a country in financial distress such as Nigeria. And so the PDP failed to take advantage of that to field a popular candidate from the Southeast and use their structure across the country to support him to emerge. That failure has caused the party this election. But the Southeast simply made a statement that we can no longer be taken for granted any longer. And that is one thing that the president-elect must ponder on and move quickly, quickly to assuage their feelings and make sure he runs an all-inclusive government that gives that region a sense of belonging so that they can be reconciled with the Nigerian state, which is their own country. And we also have to commend the northern wing of the APC, who, unlike their counterparts in the PDP, decided to toe the path of honor I said, look, we've had presidency for eight years, between 2015 and 2023. And we had support from certain elements in the southern part of this country to make sure that power shifted to the north in 2015. So it is payback time. And so during the primary elections, they made sure they zeroed their support to southern candidates against even one or two northern, northern aspirants that vied for the, for the party uh, flag at their convention. You saw that concerted effort. You saw that dedication to say, look, we need to keep to our words. Mm -hmm. We need to keep to our agreements. And as we emerge first at the primary uh, elections of the party, and then subsequently, you saw the support that some of these governors tried to give to him in their strongholds, particularly in the Northwest, 
and parts of the North Central to complement whatever food he was going to bring from his own home region too, because he was also a homeboy. And that resulted into his narrow margin of lead that has, you know, translated into his becoming the president elect today. So the PDP failed to do what the APC did. So the PDP let the Southeast down. The PDP particularly must be held responsible for that. However, this shows that you can no longer take the Southeast for granted. They had a very strong showing in this election, and this provides an opportunity for the president-elect, who must take the lead now, in healing a fractured country, a fractured country from a very divisive election. So he has to take the lead. He shouldn't wait for Peter Obi, or Atiku for that matter, to call him. No, he should be the one making the call this time around, mm. because he needs to legitimize his victory. He needs to reach out to them. He needs to visit them. He needs to do all within his power to bring them on board and run a government of national unity that will be focused on the national rebirth of this country. Mm. I don't know how that is going to be accepted because part of the reason why uh, the, you know, we saw a lot of people rejecting, as you said, Nigerians rejected the APC. A majority of Nigerians did not vote for the APC. Yes. Their votes were divided on, uh, you know, along all other uh, platforms. But if you put it together, they rejected the APC. How do you then think that those Nigerians we will now see the people whom they voted for joining um, another, the certain government, which, whose party they had rejected at the polls, you know, in the name that they are about to do a government of national unity or that they are building a, a country. That is even the more reason why a government of national unity is imperative. What does it mean? As what you won the election, as declared by the constituted authority to so declare. But he won with a minority of the vote, total votes cast in the elections. So which means more Nigerians voted against the APC. It was like a vote of no confidence on the APC for his performance in eight years. That makes a government of national unity very imperative, meaning that Aswaji must have to sit down with the three leading candidates in the opposition side to look at their programs of action for government. What was it that they campaigned with that got Nigerians to vote for them so massively? He needs to now merge it with his own vision for Nigeria and make sure you come up with something that is like a safe compromise that can have the confidence of all of Nigerians and can be implemented incrementally to yield dividend of democracy in terms of improved welfare and security almost immediately. Mm. And so you will need all hands to be on deck as well as the ideas from these co-contestants. But for him to achieve that, he must have a very peaceful and consolatory disposition from now, henceforth. For a number of people, they say that what they have a problem with is the process. Uh, that exactly. they would have been able to accept this if the process was a little bit more transparent. And that's why I need well, to take responsibility for this going into the next elections. Exactly. We're going into the governorship yes. elections. What major lesson, what major factor do you think INEC really needs to work on? INEC should endeavor in this next election to transmit results as they promised in real time so that people can monitor and avoid some of this legitimacy crisis we are seeing now. You know, the point I'm simply trying to make is this. While we cannot absorb INEC, and it's not even absorbable from their underperformance, the result, nevertheless, still seems to reflect certain realities before and during these elections. For me, they have done exceedingly well. They practically disrupted the entire process like nobody saw, and they did it positively peacefully, in a very organized manner. They, they proved bookmakers and naysayers wrong. Those who described them as four people tweeting from a room, those who said they are, they are just on Twitter, they're not on ground, they don't have PVCs. These young men and women came out to prove otherwise. And they made a loud statement. They took 11 states plus the FCT. They won the polling units in the villa. So this tells you that, look, something is changing. And so the pressure will now be on the print elect to hit the ground running in delivering the dividends of democracy from day one. In fact, this is one of the best elections I've seen in the outcome because the president was not coronated by an overwhelming majority vote of Nigerians. He was reluctantly hired. So he'll be on edge. It's like on probation. He needs to prove a point that we need to make his employment permanent. Majid Dahiro, thank you for coming on Hard Copy. Thank you very much for having me. Well, that's our program tonight. Comments and feedback are welcome to the handle showing on your screen. Thank you for watching. I'm Mark Welguin Yusuf. Good night.